Okay, let's start looking 20 right, about 12 Checking miles. Target heading 160.8, 18 fast. Can't get the second man in. He's uh, right, right, 50. Right, yeah. 22 right, 10 miles. Okay. So you're trying to talk about one mile blind. I'm heads out. Yeah, I think we're in. About 3 degrees high. Yeah. Okay, full power now. We've got not excess. Yeah, we're okay. we'll looking through them. So we should be in both the same piece of the sky. 20 right here. 20 right now. You're far from the high speed. Got it. Hell yeah. 160.8. 20 right. Uh, it's a good one. It's a good one. It's a Okay, I saw him Sunday. Well, wait till you see him properly. Okay. Come on, Ed. Come on, come on. He's good there on the on charge. He's got a lot to do. He's just screwed on this. Okay, five points. Hang on. Carry the ship. Go with it. Now, I'm going to go. Okay, now he's coming. Okay. Carry it coming down. Okay, I've got one on my right right now. 3-9 line. Got him. 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 All right, keep it. I'm trying the first man I saw. Okay. One man on our six and a right hand turn. No tie. Okay, keep it. Right three low is the second man. Okay. Right three low. Right, we're going to get a bit. He's turning. He's turning. Okay, I'm trying to go that high. They're stacked up each other now. Yep. Yeah. Okay, I'm one to the right hand, one to the left hand. Okay. Which man are you taking? Uh, that high. I'm okay. that high. Okay. That's true. I'll watch the low hand. You can't switch. Okay, come out off the uh, switch to switch to switch. Out switch to switch. Okay, they're coming out uh, north of Tilly Lake. There they go. Okay. 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 I think the uh, biggest impression I had when I first flew the Spitfire um, was, I suppose you could say, heat and fire. Whereas you're normally used to sitting in a aeroplane, which is cabin, the cabin conditioning provides you with a controlled environment. It's relatively quiet, certainly in an aeroplane like the Tornado. When I first got in the Spitfire, there was a smell, the smell of dope fuel, aviation fuel, um, and it's got a distinctive smell to it. I was also uh, very impressed with the fact, of course, you, unlike a jet, where so many of the systems are controlled for you, particularly, again, in the tornado by computers, in the Spitfire, you've got to do it all yourself. First of all, you've got manual controls, the engine, whether it be a Merlin or a Griffin, uh, as in the later versions, has to be effectively tended. Um, you have to control not only the engine power but the propeller speed. You have to watch very carefully the, uh, both the pressures, particularly oil pressure. And so it was quite a, a daunting prospect when I first sat in the, in the aeroplane for the first time. Um, again, the noise was something to get used to. Although a jet is outwardly very noisy, inside the cockpit you hear very little. However, in a Spitfire you really do the, hear the engine. You're sitting behind, um, in the case of a Griffin, 2500 horsepower with the Merlins less, but still very noisy. And of course, unlike a, a modern aircraft which has got a nose wheel, you have to keep it straight on the runway, you can't see in front of you, and so there's very much flashing around the controls. But once you get the Spitfire airborne, you've instantly realize that it is an absolute thoroughbred. It almost does what you think rather than the way you fly it. And you instantly realize that R.G. Mitchell designed an absolute, absolutely wonderful aeroplane. Um, nonetheless, it does take a lot of flying, um, and particularly in the landing configuration. Um, not the least because you've got a nose out there which is almost as long from where I'm sitting to the tip of the um, propeller or to the tip, tip of the spinner as it is to the tip of the rudder at the back. 
And you have to land it in a three-point attitude because obviously we're flying with a tailwheel aeroplane. And on modern runways, whereas these were designed originally to fly on the, on the, on, from grass airfields, uh, on a runway they can be a bit skittish. And whereas you can put a jet down, you've got nose wheel steering, almost computers which keep it straight. With a Spitfire, you really have to fly it very, very, um, almost right the, down to the point it is stopped. Otherwise, if you ignore at any stage uh, the aeroplane, it will bite and normally take you off the runway. Okay, the first thing, when you're getting into the Spitfire, apart from the normal uh, look of left to right checks, as we would say, um, you've got to get the engine started. Now, the Merlin and the Griffin uh, are liquid-cooled engines, they're big V12 engines, but uh, are liquid-cooled. So they do take need, uh, airflow going through radiators, to provide an enormous amount of coolant, which is a, a water glycol mixture, to keep that big engine uh, cool. Now on the ground, obviously, there's very little airflow going through those radiators. So one of the first considerations before you even start the aeroplane, unlike a jet where you can sit there for hours almost with the engines idling, you certainly can't in one of these aeroplanes. Because if you do, the first thing that will happen is your radiator temperature will, will go off the right-hand scale and she'll start to boil. So before you start, uh, you've got to make sure that your takeoff is almost assured within about 10 minutes and on a hot day maybe even less so what we do is we prime the engine and uh, the way we do that is we switch the fuel on and we have a thing called a chi gas primer so once the fuel is on and we've done our left to right check we do that by injecting pure neat fuel into the cylinders we then set the throttle switch the magnetos on and hit the start button to get together with the boost coil. Normally, they're very good, and they'll normally fire after the prop has gone around a couple of times. Now, the next thing you've got to be very careful of is you've got an enormous fan at the front of this, um, this aircraft, and if you've opened the throttle too quickly, uh, without the stick being back, you've got a danger of lifting the tail, because you've got an enormous amount of blow coming over, so you have to control it, even on start. And there are examples the people with the Spitfire actually standing it on its nose in the start sequence because they've used too much power. You check your oil pressure, oil temperature, radiator temperatures, make sure the pressures are all, all up. And that largely, once you've made a radio call, is you're off. Obviously checking that you've got brakes. High tower, clear takeoff, surface wind 1207. Okay, we'll give you a call from Marham, and uh, if you'd advise Marham that I uh, will be going past them down to Halesworth uh, for my first, uh, before returning to Marham. So uh, I'll pop downstairs and give you a radar service uh, outbound to uh, have you direct Marham. That's good. Spitfire Mark 19, a late development uh, version of the Spitfire, particularly because it, uh, it gained an uprated engine with the, with the Griffin. The Griffin is a similar configuration to the Merlin engine in that it's a V12 engine, but uh, vastly more powerful. With the early, earlier Spitfires and the, um, the engines, the Merlins that were in, in them, started off around about the 1,000 horsepower. Uh, mark, and they developed through the various marks, through the uh, Mark IIs, the Mark Vs, the Mark Nines, and eventually the uh, the Griffin Spitfire started to come into production. In fact, the Griffin engine was in existence parallel to the uh, Merlin, so it wasn't a direct development of the same engine. It was actually running in parallel, and uh, was actually in the Mark 
3 Spitfire that never came into operational service. This is a Mark 19 and this Griffin has got in the order of 2100 to 2200 horsepower so it's a very powerful motor and as you can see the propeller to uh, to transmit that all that power into uh, speed and performance is a five bladed propeller. Now the engine obviously uh, the Merlin engine and the Griffin engine were part of the success story of the Spitfire. Um, indeed, the propellers were part of a success as well because the earlier propellers were just two-bladed and actually only had two pitch settings. Later propellers went to three-bladed and then more four-bladed and were actually constant speed units. In other words, they, the pitch could be optimized for the uh, engine RPM and the power at the time. Now, as far as the uh, Spitfire fuselage was concerned, the early Spitfires all had the uh, same um, lovely elliptical wing which became uh, R.J. Mitchell's trademark as far as this aeroplane was concerned. It went through various stages. It had an A-wing, a B-wing and an E-wing, um, all to do with the various armaments that were fitted into this wing. Now this one is a PR-19, so we don't have any armament in it at all. Um, but it's a very similar aircraft to the Spitfire Mark 14, which had cannons in the wing. So this particular Mark, uh, very much heavier than the earlier ones, so when it was in its operational fit in the war with full cameras, full fuel, and uh, remember, in the earlier Spitfires, we only had fuel in the front full fuselage here, just behind the engine and in front of the pilot. Now, in these later marks, we still had fuselage fuel there, but we also had fuel in the leading edge of the main plane, in the main plane itself, uh, to the rear of the cockpit, and also it could carry underwing tanks. So this mark of Spitfire probably was in the 7,500 pounds region, whereas the early Spitfires were in the 6,000 pound region, um, quite, a, quite light. And you will see, if you compare, and I'll just point across here, you'll see that the Hurricane is next door to us today. Um, the Hurricane is actually a bigger aeroplane altogether, than the, certainly than the earlier Spitfires, uh, both in size um, and where it stood off the ground. Indeed, the Hurricane in some ways was more robust in some of its functions. Um, it wasn't an all-metal aeroplane like the Spitfire. Um, the, the forward fuselage was and the wings, uh, certainly in the later mark, but the rest of the fuselage in the Hurricane is actually fabric, uh, whereas the Spitfire itself was completely metal. And when it first came out, the Spitfire actually produced quite a few problems in production. The, uh, and that's one of the reasons why we saw the Hurricane coming in in su such uh, larger numbers. And that's why, indeed, at the battle of, in the Battle of Britain, there were more hurricanes than there were Spitfires. However, they did overcome the production problems with this new aeroplane, uh, new concept of aeroplane with the Spitfire, and eventually uh, many more were produced. Let's give a walk around. Um, on the earlier Spitfires, we had um, just one, just one radiator. Remember that the Merlin and the Griffin engines are, are liquid-cooled engines, so some way of cooling down that water glycol mixture which cools this vast, uh, this, this high power unit. And in the earlier Spitfires we just had one of these radiators. You can see with the bigger Griffin that required a greater cooling effect so we've got two large radiators here. One of the problems with the earlier Spitfires were, you can see where this undercarriage leg is, well we had one radiator and it sat behind the undercarriage so on the ground uh, particularly on the early Spitfires, they're really prone to boiling very quickly. Whereas on the Hurricane, the um, radiator was in line with the engine, so it wasn't quite so quick to boil. So we have to watch that, and um, about seven minutes, I would say, from the time you start in the baby, we call them the baby Spitfires on BBMF, that's the Mark II and the Mark V, on a hot day in the summer, yes, about seven minutes it would before we really need to get airborne, before our radiator temperature is going up. And we don't want to boil them because they just siphon off the uh, coolant. On the undercarriage itself, much more, it's uh, heavier duty tires and a heavier duty undercarriage on this later mark of Spitfire, but the configuration is just the same. 
And one disadvantage was that it, it, unlike the Hurricane, you can see these wheels are fairly narrow track. Uh, that's because they fold from in to out, out, whereas the Hurricane was out to in. And that narrow track on a um, on a tarmac runway with a crosswind can be a, can give you a bit of a, a problem, especially again on the earlier mark of uh, Spitfires, where there's not the great uh, not the um, uh, large rudder or fin which we've got on this mark. Uh, you literally can run out of rudder in in a crosswind, which gives you a, a fairly violent swing. Right, let's have a quick uh, we'll wander around. The, the lines of the uh, wing are, are quite are quite wonderful. Now this this wing uh, was such an advanced desi uh, design. Um, it gives you such super lift. But it also provides quite a high mark number for a straight winged airplane. You've still got all the problems of compressibility, but um, there are records of test pilots who took the Spitfire. Uh, to near the speed of sound, I have to say, with some rather dramatic results. Uh, things like uh, uh, engine panels and propellers coming off and canopies sh sh uh, shattering. But there is a recorded event of a test pilot who, I believe, broke the, s the sound barrier in one of these, but quite damaged the airplane and sadly killed himself two weeks later trying to do the same thing. I'm not about to try and break the sound barrier in this Spitfire. Indeed, today, these aeroplanes are venerable. We've got to keep them flying for many years to come. So um, we restrict restrict BBMF to about 275 knots um, in our normal display work. And we keep the G down uh, departure in this aeroplane. We actually have a G meter so that we can keep the fatigue on these aeroplanes down. And we restrict ourselves to uh, three and a half, uh, never exceed four. When these aeroplanes were being developed. I said they were all metal, but some of the earlier ones had uh, fabric covered ailerons and uh, they hovered between metal covered and fabric covered. Um, and you'll see on this aeroplane, although we went to uh, metal covered ailerons, which gave you a much better control, when they went to, when they attempted to put metal on the uh, tailplane, in, on the rudder and the elevators, they found the aeroplane was just not the same. So you'll see when we get to the back end, they've actually fabric covered. It's got um, a single flap setting. It's, that's controlled by pneumatics. The undercarriage is controlled by hydraulics. And the flaps come down a split flap on the bottom of the wing. Obviously, because they come down underneath the wing, we have no gauge inside the, the cockpit, unlike the Hurricane. So these two little flaps here come up so that once you've selected the flap down, you know you've got them. You know you've got them anyway, because you get a, a fairly marked trim, trim change on the aeroplane. Um, we'll get round to the cockpit in a second from the other side. Suffice to say that this particular aeroplane, because it was photo reconnaissance, actually had a pressurized cockpit, which was unusual for the Spitfire. Only certain marks actually did. Um, as I say, early Spitfires, no fuel in the back. This one had the ca capacity to do so. And normally this was where the radio compartment was. Um, later marks of Spitfire, Mark 8s, and uh, when we got to the later marks, actually had a retractable tail wheel as well. And you can see the, the doors coming out um, there. So we actually do get three greens in this aeroplane, unlike the early Spitfires, which were a fixed tail wheel and down. Fully castering, and again, unlike the Hurricane, which has got a spring breakout, so when you're taxiing in the, or landing in the hurricane, once you've got the tailwind down, it tends not to swing quite so much. In the Spitfire, it's fully castering, so it can give you some quite exciting moments if it starts to swing. Um, I think we all believe that landing on tarmac runways with a Spitfire, uh, that uh, it's not landing it, very, very controllable in the landing attitude. It's once you're down that exciting moments happen. And we all say that the landing's not complete in the Spitfire until you're literally down to a, a slow walking pace because it's capable of biting you right up to the end. One of the joys of the Spitfire is its enormous, um, uh, enormously uh, powerful elevator. So when you are flying in display, it gives you a lot of feel. And indeed, you have a lot of elevator authority right down to very slow speed. 
you tend to run out of it a bit in the hurricane, uh, especially at the slower speeds. But um, in the uh, Spitfire, all it flies right down to the stall, and the stall is very predictable. Big, big rudder and a big fin on this mark of Spitfire for the reasons I explained earlier on. If you get a lot of swing on with a big engine such as this, you need this sort of rudder to be able to counter the torque, certainly on takeoff. And it also helps with any sort of crosswind. Uh, the earlier Spitfires uh, had a much smaller fin and rudder. Um, nonetheless, it flies very well. Right, we'll, go, we'll walk up back through. Um, on the earlier Spitfires, uh, and indeed on the majority of Spitfires, all of, they all had a door about here all the unpressurized Spitfires. So you've obviously seen photographs of this door which is uh, it's hinged down and gives easy access. We don't have one on this aeroplane because again, as I said earlier, it's a pre it was capable of pressurization when it was uh, in service. So it had a pressure cockpit. Didn't want any leakage through a door. So there's no door on this particular one, yet the canopy slides in much the same way. You'll also notice it's got a curved um, front wind screen, quite unusual again for a Spitfire, um, in that normally they had a bulletproof windscreen there on the fighter versions, unnecessary for this unarmed uh, fighter version, which could actually fly at tremendous heights, and with that fuel load was capable of going to Berlin and back. Early Spitfires were not nearly so capable and in terms of range, um, and so during the Battle of Britain, you'll hear, hear of them taking off from Biggin Hill and Hornchurch, etc. And uh, once they had fought their battles over the Kent coast, they really were hurting for fuel. And of course, the ME109 ME was in a similar situation. He was flying over from France, and sometimes they literally only had five and ten minutes of combat fuel, which is a great disadvantage to the German Luftwaffe pilots. And so very often they were running home really hurting because they had no, no fuel left. The weather today, we're in a weak, uh, high-pressure area, giving fairly benign weather conditions, as you see. You can all see the cross-section before today. With a light northwesterly wind, good visibility, and broken cloud at 2,500 feet. Navigation, please. The Lancaster, when we do our own, our own individual display, Captain, will be also running in yeah. from the northeast. Therefore, the join for whoever will be joining us. Me will be to the northwest. And Lincoln. Now, do you want to do another fly pass of Martin's score on the way back, Captain? No. Or just on the way out? Correct. Just on the way out. The frequencies, while we're talking about it, obviously from here to approach to Waddington 12735, and then over to Scanton 12535, which will be our display frequency. Oh, <laughs> Seven to hopefully two thousand. Any of you transponder equipped? Uh, Lancaster, solid. Lancaster, signal time, we're going for two suits. Thanks, I'm at it. Lancaster, signal time, we're going for two suits. Lancaster, signal time, we're going for two suits. Lancaster,
Oh, Hurricane is starting. Bye, Tower, Roger, Romeo 26, the QFE 1016, QNH 1017, the outside air is plus 70. with the development of this marvelous airframe, R.J. Mitchell had to find an engine to put in the front. And uh, he had been part of the, the team. Indeed, he'd been a driving force in the team that had previously worked on the supermarine seaplanes, which had won the Schneider's Trophy. And an engine that eventually came out of that, or one of the engines that came out of that, was an engine which eventually became known as the Merlin. A, uh, in itself quite a radical design, a V12 engine, um, liquid-cooled, um, and one which was, at that time, they were thought, thinking of the 1,000 horsepower region. And indeed, that's what this uh, Merlin engine did produce. In what was quite a light airframe in the Spitfire, monoplane, very sleek, and hence it met or exceeded, indeed it exceeded, just about all of the Air Ministry specifications for the new RAF fighter. And so it very quickly caught the Air Ministry's eyes and was uh, ran off on development. Now all wasn't quite as uh, sweet and light as that because um, it was such a radical design. It was an all-metal aeroplane, generally all-metal aeroplane, with a monocoque construction, which in itself was radical for those days. As opposed to the Hurricane, which Sir Sidney Cam, in his genius, was also developing, um, also built around the Merlin engine, but rather built 
um, in terms of construction along the lines of his previous um, Hawker bike plane series. And indeed, the Hurricane proved to be very much easier to produce in those early days preceding the war. And you must remember, there was great pressure at that time to produce an aeroplane because the uh, clouds of war were definitely forming with Hitler uh, saber-rattling, indeed more than saber-rattling. Of course, it was quite a departure for the air crews of those days who had been used to flying much slower biplane aeroplanes which were touching down at slower speeds and certainly taking off at slower speeds and operating at slower speeds. So um, there was quite an education program for the pilots, a new monoplane fighter. But everybody who flew it, um, despite being new to the aeroplane, delighted at the, the responsiveness um, and the acceleration and the overall performance of this wonderful aeroplane. Albeit, it was quite a tricky aeroplane to land, uh, quite a narrow undercarriage in this uh, little airframe and an undercarriage that folded into the centre giving you a very narrow track and there were many incidents of aeroplanes landing and nosing over or ground looping. Indeed the Hurricane with a wider track undercarriage um, was in some ways more robust than the Spitfire in working from unprepared or semi-prepared airfields and that proved to be the case in many campaigns where the, the Spitfire delight that it was the hurricane actually could go farther, um, farther afield because of the areas it could operate from. Nonetheless, uh, by the start of the Battle of Britain, it wrote its own uh, chapter in history in the Second World War because of the delight it was to fly faster and it was a match at that time for the BF 109E. Certainly when they started to develop propellers, because although it was a good design, um, there were still areas in which the 109 Messerschmitt could outperform the Spitfire and so there was a great deal of attention that went on to developing areas of the uh, aircraft. Spitfire Ground Check 1221. Eight machine guns gave way to cannons being put in the wings for greater hitting power because the fighter pilots were getting a little bit fed up with um, machine gun bullets which simply didn't penetrate uh, the enemy aircraft and couldn't down them in the same way that the 20 millimeter uh, cannons could. But even that was shrouded in controversy because there were many, like for instance Douglas Bader, who, who thought that the eight machine guns getting in close was the answer, whereas people maybe of Sailor Milan, or the OC-74 squadron, felt that the cannons were the way to go. And indeed it, the cannon was the way they went in the end to get that extra hitting power. One point. Once you get inside the uh, Spitfire, um, first off strap in and then we do what we call our left to right checks. Left to right checks are are fairly universal in all aeroplanes and it does allow us to do checks in an ordered sequence to make sure that prior to start, prior to taxi and prior to takeoff, everything is where it should be. In the Spitfire we'll have settled ourselves down strapped in with both our parachute and our main harness and then we'll, we'll simply, I'll go to the centre actually and do a full and free control check of the ailerons, of the elevators, over the over my shoulders and also of the rudders. Particularly important with the rudders, I've got two screw jacks down here on the floor which I can move with my feet which gives me the right distance of the rudder bars from, 
um, out and in. I have mine fully out. I then start round the cockpit. I check all the electrical switches are in the right uh, place. At this stage, I check that the generator switches are ready on. Then I've got the trims. Trims are vital in the Spitfire because unlike modern aeroplanes, where to a degree, a lot of the problems for trimming have been taken out almost automatically because of fly-by-wire, you have to trim the uh, Spitfire constantly, particularly on takeoff. The massive propeller and a massive engine in front of you, tremendous torque. Um, and so we have to offset that with rudder, particularly on takeoff. So the first thing I check is full and free on the rudder trim. And in this case, because it's a Griffin engine, and I'll talk about that later, I check that it's fully left. Uh, in a Merlin engine Spitfire, I check that the rudder trim is fully right because it goes around the other way. Uh, then I check the elevator trim. I do that full and free and leave it third to a half of a notch up in the takeoff position. Then I'm at the throttle quadrant, and this is where I check three main things. I check full and free movement of the throttle, which controls simply um, the boost, i.e. The, uh, the fuel going into the engine. I also checked the propeller control, full and free, and then I leave it in the fully fine position, i.e. a low gear position, and I also check the throttle friction. RPM, most important, uh, because uh, we want to be able to control the speed of the propeller relative to the boost we're putting into the engine. Boost gauge here, effectively how much power we're producing with the aeroplane, uh, with the uh, engine. And in this case, uh, a Griffin used to be rated up to a maximum boost of plus 18 inches. Today we restrict it to plus 7, maybe plus 8, but normally plus 7. Early Spitfires only had um, fuel tankage of about 84 gallons, uh, which sat in two tanks, one above the other, just in front of the instrument panel. Indeed, this Spitfire still got that sort of tankage. But this one has also got additional tankage in the wings. Indeed, when it was operational, being a photo reconnaissance aeroplane, it also had tankage behind and the option of strapping tanks on, which made it quite a heavy beast for a Spitfire. But this one actually just shows you when the the fuel starts to flow once you get down to about 80 gallons, i.e. the fuselage fuel, once the wings are fed, this little gauge here, it's like, like a little peanut, it starts to rotate this way round, and as it gets down to about 50 gallons, this needle takes over and starts to unwind that way. So literally the fuel gauge winds round and it's a composite, quite an interesting gauge. Power uh, Spitfire into backtrack. Spitfire clear into backtrack 230 10. I can see little ahead in the Spitfire um, with a nose which is sticking so far in the air. So I have to weave and I have my seat fully up and I'm looking out the side to ensure that uh, all is well. Spitfire check the service end. Spitfire 2306 knots. Right there, we're just lining up for a run up. What we'll do is uh, we'll go out, we'll do our pre takeoff checks, which involve further left to right checks, um, ensuring that. We've done a run-up. We normally run up to 1,500 RPM on these. Again, check the magnetos. Checking again, oil pressures and temperatures, um, radiator temperatures. All is well. Fuel is on. Trims are in the right position. Final check of your straps, um, and then we're off. We tend to not line up directly in line with the runway to start with. We're just a couple of degrees off, so we can still see that we've got a good takeoff run. Um, if we lined up straight in front of the runway, we wouldn't see very much, only a little bit either side. Fire takeoff. Spitfire cleared at takeoff 2406. Give me a right hand turn out for a flyby before proceeding to Boston. Final check, and then we're up with the power. Uh, fully fine on the prop. Fr the friction is good, so it doesn't come back when we change hands. Up. On the, uh, on the power, gradually increasing the boost, the aeroplane accelerates very quickly, countering the swing with the uh, rudder, 
looking down on the boost, boost coming through plus four, and also a quick check of the engine instruments, particularly oil pressure. Speed's coming up, tail is by now up, and I'm being able to look over the nose, keeping it straight on the rudders, and flying the aeroplane by now on the on the ailerons as well, keeping it straight, trying to keep it in the middle, and starting to look for 60, 70, 75 knots the airplane starting to come up to fly. Um, off, the, off the ground, open off, not falling it straight into the air, letting it stabilize. Again, quick round, not picking the gear up too quickly. If I have a sudden power failure now, last thing I want, if I've got lots of runway in front of me anyway, is, is the undercarriage up. Yes, good. I'm now changing hands. I change hands left and right because the undercarriage selector is on the right-hand side. Climbing safely away, I out, up, and in, and the undercarriage starts to travel. I then change back, right hand on the control column, hand back on the throttle, and I'm watching for the gear to uh, lock up. Yes, I get three reds. Unusually for an old aeroplane, in, an, in a modern aeroplane you get reds when the undercarriage is unsafe or travelling. In this aeroplane you get no lights when the undercarriage is travelling and three reds when it's up. I'm now looking, the aeroplane's accelerating quite quickly now. Um, I'm clean, I'm re-trimming because as I go faster I can take some of that, tr that trim I've had off. Not only with the rudder, but I'm re-trimming uh, for the acceleration in uh, pitch. Next, I've got to come off takeoff power. Uh, we don't want to keep uh, the engine at high boost and high RPM, so I'm looking for climbing power. So, first of all, I start to move the boost back. Now, with a um, piston engine, you always put, as you're accelerating the engine or putting the power up, you always use the fine off the propeller first and then put the power up. When you're coming back on power, you always come back on the throttle first and then coarsen off the propeller. So what we're looking for is a climbing setting for the engine. So I'm coming back to plus four boost from the plus seven I could have had, uh, finally for takeoff, plus four boost, and I'm bringing the RPM back to 2400 RPM, looking at the speed and climb at about 140, 150 knots. The later marks of Spitfire, despite the development of the jet engine, would climb much faster than uh, the early jets albeit they had top speed over it. And again, I'm looking around, checking I've got fuel flow. Indeed, on the uh, Spitfire, you've, you've got no way the fuel, you know the fuel is flowing, um, but it won't start to register until you're off the wings. And then you're into the climb. We'll climb to a good height, say four or 5,000 feet, because without an engine, good an aeroplane as the Spitfire is, without an engine, it comes down very fast. And um, from 3,000 feet, you'll probably only get a 270 degree turn in flying at reasonable speeds before you're back on the ground. So at least at 5,000 feet, within the wing arc and the propeller arc, you could find maybe a field big enough to land in if you had an engine failure. So we want height. We don't. We're then in a cruise configuration. To get the best fuel consumption, we again throttle back down towards zero boost maybe, um, maybe with a little bit of plus boost because it likes being supercharged and we coarsen the propeller back to about 2000 rpm it almost sees it going very slowly you almost feel as if you can hear the pots going in the cylinders um, and it will cruise along today we cruise it along at about 180 knots and the fuel consumption is very good and with the 121 gallons of fuel we carry we can probably get two and a half hours out of the aeroplane um, even with maybe one display included. For a display, we obviously put the RPM up to about 2650, 2650, and we use a boost setting of about plus seven um, for the sort of maneuvers we want to do in display. And that really is the delights of flying the Spitfire, uh, an aeroplane which every time I fly evokes um, feelings of great privilege that I'm one of uh, very few people who are, are able to fly the Spitfire uh, today and also conscious that uh, this aeroplane took very many brave men into war, many who didn't return.